welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. In the late 1970s, Britain was in deep political and economic crisis. A class struggle was raging, a Labour government clinging to power, a resurgent right led by Margaret Thatcher grasping for that power. Not to just shake it, but to break the kaleidoscope. Things the British never dared think, like the possibility of a military coup led by the Queen's uncle, Earl Mountbatten, or the state waging covert war against the citizenry, appeared on the agenda and on the streets. The now noble Lord Dobbs, then plain Michael, a functionary of Margaret Thatcher, was at the heart of things. When it was over and Dobbs discarded by the Iron Lady, he wrote The House of Cards, a bleak but all too plausible novel about the dark places in British politics. It was a great success, especially when turned into a BBC classic TV series. The series then crossed the Atlantic for a US version released by Netflix, which was, though it hardly seemed possible, even darker and more brilliant than the original, earning Golden Globes and Emmys by the dozen. And for Lord Dobbs, more plaudits, and though as an English gentleman he couldn't possibly comment more millions of pounds than he could ever have dreamt of when he first put pen to paper all those years ago. Earlier in Parliament, I caught up with the author. Lord Dobbs, more than 25 years ago you wrote the novel House of Cards. It has become just a phenomenal success, both as a book and as a television series in Britain, now in the United States. You must be very proud of it. It must be a great achievement. I'm not sure I'm very proud of it in the sense I'm not quite sure how much I deserve all of this uh, as a claim, but I'm desperately glad and happy with it. I mean, it's changed my life. Um, it changed my life 25 years ago when I started writing it as a, as a complete accident. It was the first thing I'd ever written, and I only wrote it uh, on holiday as a, almost as a result of a bet. And it, 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 I even, didn't even know that I would finish it, let alone get it published. Um, yet it's changed my life and is still changing my life to this day, and all for the better. So, not proud, but actually really pleased to be associated with it. Mrs. Thatcher, of course, was uh, uh, your employer. Um, to what extent uh, does this darkness uh, at the heart of House of Cards and its successors, and it is very dark in places, come from your real life experience in British politics? Oh, a huge amount of it. I mean, you'll remember those days, just before Maggie Thatcher got into power in 1979. We had a Labour government that was teetering on the brink. Week after week, night after night, it was surviving by majorities of one or two. Big ideological battles in politics in those days, much more so than they are in this country today. Um, and, and people were, were willing to risk everything to win those battles, even their lives. I mean, we know that there are MPs who got from out of their sick beds and came to Parliament in order to vote and risk their lives in doing so. And some of them actually gave their lives. Um, it was commitment on both sides for what they believed in. And I've always been a bit of a bit of a sucker for that. You know, politicians who actually <laughs> believe in something. Mm. Um, and, and so, because it was, well, it was a form of warfare. Yeah, there were all sorts of dark bits going on, uh, tricks being played. And uh, I keep saying that 90% of what went into House of Cards I had witnessed um, or been part of, but not in the same week or from the same person. But it, it, politics is a rough and tough business, and uh, that's what the book tried to reflect. Nobody was killed, I'm assuming. I, I don't do know the statute of limitations, but I you oughtn't to incriminate yourself in any, anyone being tossed off the roof of this building. I, uh, although I did encourage John Major, when he was having a very tough time with the press, to start holding his press conferences up, on the roof of the, the House of Commons. Uh, uh, yes, um, the bastards uh, uh, who made his life a uh, misery. They uh, could have been tossed over there like, uh, mm. like Matty. So the spring uh, for this magnificent uh, achievement as I describe it, uh, is your real life experience uh, in British politics. I found, as a parliamentarian now for more than a quarter of a century myself, I found the House of Cards, as you put it, 18, 90 percent, absolutely in touch with what actually goes on here. Bit of exaggeration, bit of uh, journalistic poetic uh, license. 
When it transferred across the Atlantic, I didn't think it was possible for the story to get darker, but it has. House of Cards US, which is launched with a great fanfare uh, this week and has won all these Golden Globes and Emmys and so on. Uh, the US edition is darker than the British. Mm. Uh, is that, you think, a, a proper reflection of the relative darkness between the two places? I, I think the first thing that's important is that it does transfer and can transfer because it's not about, it's not about politics. It's simply about people in politics. Great drama is not based around the minutiae of, of, of this policy or that policy. It's based about the, the passions and the vulnerabilities and the courage and the frailties of people in politics. And it's character that makes great drama. And this, Westminster or Washington, they are some of the greatest backcloths you could possibly have for, for great drama. Um, uh, the American, let's say, in much the same way as the end of the Thatcher era was a wonderful time for uh, some rather cynical, tongue-in-cheek political drama as House of Cards was. Uh, now is a very good time for, uh, for, for this sort of approach in, in Washington because people are crying out for something different. It's all very well having people who are like, like President Obama who wants to be good and do great things, but actually at the end of the day, that in itself is not enough. Uh, when we watched in more innocent days, more backward days, when we watched House of Cards, we had to wait uh, Sunday night, I think it was. We had to wait mm -hmm. for each Sunday night to see what happened next. Then we could buy box sets of DVDs, mm -hmm. which is how I watched the Ameri first American uh, series. But the method that's been chosen of Netflix releases everything at one go. Mm -hmm. Thus for um, uh, obsessives like me, I'll watch, I'm sure, the entire series mm -hmm. over uh, one weekend and mm -hmm. I can do it. Uh, by subscribing to Netflix. I know you won't have been involved in uh, necessarily in the minutiae of the platforms that are being used, but does it seem to you that that's the, the shape of things to come? Mm. Uh, the mass release, complete release of a whole series? It was one of the hugely exciting parts of this for me. I mean, when they came and said, we want to buy the rights from you, it's, you're, you're selling your house effectively. But when they said that we're gonna put uh, Kevin Spacey and David Fincher in there, I thought this, you know, I don't need to think about this. And then to be part of what is really a television revolution. Netflix came out of the, uh, the, the, the industry that was renting out DVDs and things like that, knew that that was not going to be enough to, to make it happen. They decided to put a lot of money into original program, cram, uh, programming and release it on the internet. Um, gambling, gambling their careers, individual careers, but gambling literally billions of dollars because there are many people involved in, in this, that this is going to be the way ahead. This is the way that people will want to watch their television in years to come. And they chose House of Cards to be the, the cutting edge of this. It's the first thing they had done as original programming. And uh, it's it had an extraordinary effect. Uh, we still have to see whether that revolution is really going to take hold. I think it will, but and the stock market believes it will. Netflix share price in the last year since they issued the first series of House of Cards has more than tripled. I hope um, you had some share uh, options. Sadly, I only wish. You know, they've, they, uh, the rough figures are that a year ago they had 30 million subscribers. Now they've got 40 million subscribers. Another 10 million subscribers and they are just starting. I mean, the business plan seems to be extraordinary. So it's not only fantastic drama and what they have produced mm. I think is just, just brilliant. I think this long form of television is going to in the end supplant even movies. I don't mean to say that movies are going to close down but the depth of characterization that you can achieve over a long TV series mm. if you're releasing it especially through Netflix in one go is far greater than you'll get in one 90 minute or 110 minute uh, movie. Mm. And, and it, interestingly, in Hollywood now, the buzz is all about television series. I mean, Homeland. We've had The we've Sopranos, had, we've uh, had The Wire, yeah. we've had Homeland. Breaking Bad Breaking and things Bad like that. Breaking Bad breaking all the uh, records. Uh, and, and, and indeed, even Downton. Downton Abbey is People outstanding. love Downton yes, Abbey. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. And to combine that time, that concentration on developing characters, which is really what makes drama work, mm. 
uh, and also providing it at the same time so you don't have to artificially break everything up hour after hour after hour and leave, create an artificial climax at the end of one episode, sure. hoping that you can remember, the viewer will remember it uh, in a week's time. Mm. You don't need to do that. So it's liberating creatively too. Lord Dobbs, thank you very much indeed George, for coming thank on you. Sputnik. Thank you. Coming up after the break, the best foreign secretary Britain never had. And again, a man who served a prime minister in number 10 Downing Street. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Sputnik. The Right Honourable Sir Gerald Kaufman, PC, MP, has been in Parliament nearly 50 years, but before that was a brilliant journalist and an assistant in Downing Street to the Labour Prime Minister, Harold Wilson. If Labour hadn't been out of power so long, he would have been Foreign Secretary. And what a difference to the world that would have made. Gerald Kaufman's relatives were murdered in the Holocaust and he grew up an ardent supporter of the State of Israel. Now he is the clearest, most authoritative voice against the crimes committed by that state and for justice for their victims. Last week in Parliament, he said it was time for international sanctions against Israel and spoke of the sea of misery in the Gaza Strip. It's a privilege to have him with us on the Sputnik today. Sir Gerald, your speeches always travel far. They have such authority and such clarity, but none more than the speech you made on Gaza last week. You're no stranger to Gaza. You've seen at first hand that sea of misery. Tell our viewers about it. I led a delegation of 60 parliamentarians from 13 European parliaments to Gaza not long ago. It was a year after the attack by the Israelis, which failed, as all Israeli attacks now do, though with huge loss of life, called Co Operation Cast Lead. A year afterwards, the smoke from the white phosphorus bombardment by Israel was still f fuming away. People say rightly, that the Syrians use chemical weapons. Nobody condemns the Israelis for using chemical weapons. Well, I do. The uh, <clears throat> massive military destruction is, of course, compounded by the economic misery. The blockade means that no meaningful economic activity can take place there. The tunnels through which some means of life uh, were passing have been destroyed uh, on the Egyptian side. And I think you were describing in Parliament the condition of life of those Palestinians who have survived these military attacks. Tell us. Scarcely any food is allowed to be brought in. So everybody, but particularly the young people and the children, are undernourished, which uh, affects them so much that it will go on to future generations. They have hardly any fresh water just for a few hours every five days, so they're diseased in that way. They have no fuel of their own, which means, apart from anything else, that a great deal of the transport now is by horse or donkey. There's hardly any electric, electrical power. Indeed, on a recent summer, because there wasn't enough electricity for air conditioning in nearby Tel Aviv, they cut off the electricity in the Gaza Strip, and Qatar had to intervene and see what it could do, which wasn't enough. No building materials are brought in, so that the schools that the Israelis destroyed, in some cases with children in them, cannot be rebuilt. Medical facilities are at their minimum. If any other country on earth was doing what the Israelis have been doing to 1.7 million Palestinians in Gaza, there will be United Nations resolutions, there will be calls for intervention, there will be sanctions, but the Israelis literally get away with murder. I'll come back to sanctions in a minute. Now, you're Jewish, your family 
suffered, some perished in the Holocaust, the greatest of all crimes, uh, which took place in the 20th century, perhaps the greatest of all crimes ever. And you grew up a supporter uh, of the State of Israel. What changed your mind? As you say, George, I grew up a supporter of the State of Israel. I, I was brought up as a Zionist. I went to Israel again and again and again on holiday. I had family there. I had friends there. But as I traveled around, because it's a small area, I would see not just Israelis in Israel living in huge comfort, subsidized by the Americans. I would see settlers in the illegal settlements living in huge comfort. And minutes away, I would go to a Palestinian township or village and see sewage flowing through the streets. And if you have any sense of justice at all, and as a Jewish child, I was brought up with a sense of justice. The disparity is unacceptable. And it's got worse. It's got worse and worse and worse the whole time. And the Israelis live in comfort. I've gone through Tel Aviv and see them sitting at their pavement cafes, complacently enjoying themselves, while hardly any distance away the Ga people in the Gaza Strip are living in total misery, but don't let's forget the people on the West Bank. They're living in misery as well. Now, of course, it is routine uh, for Israeli propagandists to pray in aid the suffering of the Jewish people in the Holocaust. You reject uh, that as a cover, don't you? I reject it with utter contempt and anger. Most of my parents' families, because my parents came here as refugees. Most of my parents' families were murdered in the Holocaust. When the Germans came to the town from which my mother came in Poland, Stashov, they lined up all the Jews to march to the railway station to be put in cattle wagons. But for those who were not well enough to march, they killed them on the spot. And they killed my grandmother, who was ill in bed, by shooting her in her bed. My grandmother did not die to provide cover for Israelis murdering Palestinian grandmothers. Well, it's hard to put it any more uh, powerfully than, than that. Uh, let's turn to what can be done about it. Uh, there is, of course, a civil movement of boycott and fight for divestment and even individual sanction. Uh, but you went further in your speech in Parliament last week. You say it's time for international, official, governmental sanctions against Israel. How would that work? The Israelis have a very high first world standard of living. That standard of living depends partly on huge financial subsidies by the United States under the spineless Barack Obama. And every politician pretty well in the United States yields to the Jewish pressure groups. And that's why they didn't do anything about it, even if they wanted to do something about it. The European Union is inactive. The British government is inactive. The Prime Minister, David Cameron, described the Gaza Strip as a prison camp. Mm. But it so happened that he said that when he was visiting a Muslim country, Turkey, Turkey yeah. and wanted to ingratiate himself with his hosts. Hardly anything is done, which is why lots of people, including me, take part in boycotts. But the boycotts, while important, are insufficiently effective. What we need and what I press for and will go on pressing for is governments. The United Nations, the European Union, the United States, 
our own country to impose economic sanctions so that the Israelis can feel what international opinion meal means. There's no point in condemning them. There's certainly no point in appealing to their better nature because they don't have a better nation. You've got to make them suffer because that's the only way they will feel anything. And economic sanctions would erode this huge first world standard of living which they enjoy on borrowed money. What you described earlier was an apartheid system. I'm one of the few people on the left who was ever in apartheid South Africa. I was there underground for the African National Congress. And the situation you described of the settlers living in great comfort whilst the indigenous uh, uh, owners of the land live in utter misery. Uh, apartheid was broken between the hammer of the struggle of the African people and the anvil of international solidarity, including sanctions and uh, boycott. Do you think uh, that such a move is going to have an effect? And if so, when? I, too, when I was Shadow Foreign Secretary, visited South Africa under apartheid uh, as the guest of the South African Council of Churches. And I was followed everywhere by South African mm -hmm. secret police. That, that is a huge difference between the apartheid that the Israelis are inflicting on the Palestinians and the loathsome and odious apartheid that existed in South Africa. There were distances, considerable distances, between Johannesburg, Cape Town, Durban, and the South African, uh, the African uh, townships. In Palestine, it's minutes, minutes, between the settlements or between Israel behind the 67 borders and the hell that they've created in Gaza and on the West Bank. So it's worse. It's worse even than the foul actions of the South African apartheid government. You've got to make these people feel it. I'm not optimistic, but I'm realistic. Nobody ever expected the Soviet Union to collapse in the way that it did, but it happened. Nobody ever expected apartheid in South Africa to collapse in the way that it did, but it happened. The Israelis are stupid to imagine that just because they've got the fourth largest arms forces in the world, they can go on like this. I learned Greek at school, and there was, there's a phrase in the historian Thucydides which says, panta re, and that means everything flows. The Israelis are balmy, complacent, and self-defeating to imagine that they can go on forever as they're going now. So, General Kaufman, a privilege to talk to you. Now it's your turn to tell us what you think in the social media review. Gatry, what's rattling? Well, everyone on Twitter supported, of course, what Sir General Kaufman was speaking out for in the Parliament last week. Lucien Quincy Senna said, it's been a long time coming for sanctions against Israel. Whether it will ever happen in our lifetime is another matter. Well, I don't know. I think it's an idea whose time has come. I'm, um, I'm not sure. I may be as skeptic as hers, because as Mr. Kaufman said, it's not about the people, the public opinion, but the government that needs to bring forth these sanctions. Yes, but as Sir Gerald said peerlessly in Greek, Everything flows. <laughs> That's right, Pantare. Uh, Pop says, hitting the Israelis in their pockets with sanctions is the best way. And that's all for this week. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. You know where to reach us on Twitter at RT underscore Sputnik. And on Facebook, you can find us on Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous. <laughs>